Hi, I'm Jonathan Tomkin from the University of Illinois. It turns out that a tragedy of the commons is not always inevitable. In particular, the commons themselves, a shared rangeland, are usually not tragic places. That is to say, they are usually not degraded. If we think of some of the classic places that have commons, like the Swiss Alps, where Swiss farmers share common pasture lands, They've actually been sustainably used for hundreds of years. So, in theory, the tragedy will take place, but in practice, it doesn't always. So what reasons prevent a tragedy from occurring? There are three broad ways in which we might solve a tragedy of the commons. The first way, we might say, is personal action. That is, what individuals can do. The second way is internal governance, or sort of social pressures. What can groups of people do act when they act together? And the third way is some kind of external force. And we would most normally think about this as a, as a government intervention. And the government intervention might be through an external regulation or through property rights, the courts, uh, and so on. So we have these three different ways that we might solve tragedies of the commons. And in fact, in the real world, we see all three being used to various effect. The first one, personal action, is very important because it ties up with our responsibility to be good stewards and ultimately we really only have power over ourselves. We don't have that much power over other people. Personal action has limitations. Hardin himself listed out three reasons why he thought that it was unlikely to succeed in, in solving the problem of the tragedy of the commons and I'm going to read them out now. Firstly, he thought it is not psychologically healthy to force people to act against their own interests on the basis of conscience. Secondly, he said it discriminates against people of good conscience who will be less successful. So you can imagine that if you're not the farmer putting out the extra cow, your children will be malnourished, they will be the ones that miss out on the education and so on. So you can see how that's a disadvantage. And finally, he said it won't work in the long run. Uh, people without conscience will be more successful and their values will dominate the system. And so again, he would argue that in the case of this commons, that if an individual said, look, it's not, it's not good for the commons if I had an extra cow, then that means that your neighbour, who will uh, not be under the same constraint, his value might be, well, we need to use what we've got. Um, because he's going to be more successful, his values will propagate through the system. You, you will have less children, perhaps, if you're really thinking in a Darwinian sense. Or simply, less people will admire your point of view, it'll be less successful, it'll create less money, create less wealth, at least in the short term. So there are three different possible objections that, that Hardin raised about it. And um, it does raise moral questions for every individual. Um, for example, would it be right if everybody else had two cows and you only had one, is it fair for you to add one more cow? Every action has its own consequences, and we have to live with our own morals and our own ethical obligations. It's not acceptable to do something just because everybody else is doing it, of course. But you can see from a systematic point of view that it might be that even if there are many individuals in a system that choose to do the right thing in terms of a sustainable course, then the commons can still have a tragic outcome because not everybody shares that moral belief or that position. So collective action is more likely to succeed. In the case of the farmers who shared a commons, you might ask, well, why don't they just talk to one another and decide? We can only have two cows each, and that's all that the commons can support. So why don't people do that? It turns out that's what people do do. When we have a tight-knit group or a society or a group of farmers, for example, they can come together and they can come to a common agreement about what sustainable use is, and then they can self-police. And in fact, we see this all the time in our own lives. Um, we negotiate with our housemates about who does the cleaning up. Um, we talk to our, our spouses about whose turn it is to take out the garbage. We can solve a tragedy of the, pro of the commons problem if the group comes together and communicates. That's a very powerful way to prevent overuse, especially when there are strong group norms about not flouting the will of the other people in the group, or there's shared respect. So Swiss pastures are a very good example of this. Uh, 
There are many other examples. For example, I have a picture here of um, uh, coordination in paddy farming where water resources are being shared amongst many rice farmers. And often there are other things that are shared too by local groups, for example, forest resources or hunting. Solving the tragedy of the commons by using internal social regulations has limits, however. What if we don't now know our neighbours very well? An example of this is cod. Cod is fished by peoples of many different countries and we don't always know people from different countries very well, we don't communicate very well, we don't coordinate our actions very well. In fact, there were three cod wars between Britain and Iceland as they competed with one another to use the cod resource. So if we're not in a position to, to use social methods to solve tragedy of the common problems, we might need to look outside that, that group to an external regulator. Normally we think about this as being a government. Lots of nation states today are very large. Here in the United States we have about 300 million people. We can't socially regulate every problem because it's impossible to know every other citizen of the country. So you can imagine how the problem gets even harder when we deal with people of other countries who speak other languages and have other legal systems and uh, moral points of view. If governments are uncorrupt and have good sources of information, this can be a good way to solve a tragedy of the commons problem because they have the power to issue uh, regulations that prevent overuse of a resource. So an example that has been tried in the, in the case of fishing stocks is to limit the amount of fish caught. There is a regulation about the size of fishing vessels, the amount that each vessel can catch, the dates, tackle used, a long list of approaches have been tried. So if governments are reliable, they know what they're doing and they have good laws, it could be that regulations can solve some tragedy of the commons problems. Unfortunately, these requirements that we have a uh, reliable government that's not corrupt and also a reliable government that has good information about the natural system, those two requirements are not always met. And so in many places in the world we see tragedies of the commons continue despite laws uh, on the books that would seem to preclude that possibility. Uh, an example is um, deforestation. A lot of countries have reasonable laws to prevent overuse of forest resources, but because the government is too weak or too corrupt to enforce those laws effectively, we see deforestation occur nonetheless. An example of this might be Haiti. Many Western fisheries have collapsed despite uh, good government, that is to say reliable government that's not corrupt and has the strength to enforce a lot of its regulations. There's a couple of reasons for this. Partly there is a lot of unreported and illegal fishing that goes on. Uh, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that between 20 and 30% of the world's oyster catch is actually uh, either illegal or unreported. Or secondly, the government just might not know enough information to make good regulations. Uh, and there's a long history of this, that the government uh, bodies involved don't know, for example, how many fish there are in the sea. And if you don't know basic information like that very well, then you can't make regulations that make it a sustainable resource very well either. And then of course there's another problem. Many of the tragedies that we're talking about occur in commons that are shared by governments all around the world. No one organisation is responsible for the world's oceans or the world's atmosphere. So if there are multiple governments that run a resource, for example the world's oceans or the fisheries, then you see how we just return back to the standard tragedy of the commons model. Each government has its own incentives, uh, but that's different from or every different nation, and the collective view is different from the individual government view. I'd just like to finish with a further thought, and that like all human creations, governments are flawed things and they're limited in their capacities. And so if individuals make poor decisions, that it's possible too that governments can make poor decisions and make poor regulations. So although they are capable of solving some of these problems, we have evidence that they haven't been able to solve all of these problems. In the previous lecture, we described the example where three farmers shared a field. 
What if they didn't share the field? What if instead they di owned different parts of it themselves? In short, there can't be a tragedy of the commons if there's no commons. So if a resource can be privatised, that is, owned by individuals, we now see an alignment between an individual's interest and the long-term interest, because they don't want to destroy this resource, they want to keep it for the next year or for the next generation. At a small scale, we see the evidence of how property rights can be used to prevent tragedies of the commons all the time. Buses are a common resource, so that if I litter in a bus, that problem is shared amongst all my fellow passengers. Contrast that to a private vehicle. If you litter in your own car, you're the person who pays the price. So we can see this as an example of how property rights um, give us an incentive to keep our own space clean. Property rights in law do not always prevent degradation, however. Reliable and uncorrupted government is needed to fairly enforce property rights. In this satellite photo, we can see the border between Haiti on the left and the Dominican Republic on the right. It's separated by a river. As you can see by looking at the picture, the Dominican Republic has many more trees. One of the reasons for this is not that the Dominican Republic has better laws, but it has better enforcement of laws. So we can see that we still require good government if we want property rights to, to successfully combat the tragedy of the commons. A second problem with privatisation is not that everything can be fairly privatised. The whole atmosphere is an excellent example of this. But it's also, it also can be hard to privatise things like fish stocks. A good example is recent fish, fishery regulation in the United States. Individual fishers are given a right to a certain percentage of the, of, of the stock. And so it becomes in their interest to make sure that the total stock doesn't diminish over time so that they have fish uh, to collect next year and the year after that and so on. It appears that this approach is working. Notice how it's not purely private or purely government, but a mixture of the two. So all of these solutions have certain elements in common. They tend to require good communication between the individuals involved. They also require that we understand the natural world so we know its limits, we know what is sustainable. And in many cases, they require that government be accountable and reliable. We also see that local problems are the most easily fixed. We know our neighbours, but that transnational problems can be the hardest. This is why greenhouse gas warming is a good example of a difficult problem to solve because it involves every nation on earth and every individual on earth. So the world is facing many tragedy of the common problems. Another such problem is arguably the world's ecosystems and the fate of individual species in those ecosystems. In other words, extinction. Can we use what we've just learned to try and understand the future fate of the world's natural biological systems and the individual species in them? Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.